Hey dancers, welcome to the show. I'm Julie and I'm your host today on this episode of Broche Banter. In this season, we're talking all about ballet training, specifically for grown-ups. I'll be sharing my philosophy on why ballet should be for everyone, how to train in order to reach a high level in ballet, how adults can actually learn classical ballet technique with fully formed bodies and busy lives, and how we can make amazing changes to the ballet world to open its doors to more adults like us. Together, we're on the path to making ballet mainstream, making it normal to learn ballet as an adult, making it a part of the fabric of our society like cycling, rock climbing, yoga, and martial arts. So come along this ride with me, and let's dance. Today on the show, we're going to talk about all of the different facets of your ballet training. We're going to talk about how complicated these stages of ballet are. We're going to talk about even why I'm calling them facets. We're going to really get into a lay of the land here. Following this episode, I'll start digging into each one individually, but we're going to kind of talk about all of them, um, how to lightly acquire each of them and how to take them back to the ballet classes that you are uh, taking in your local studios or in your online classes. So to start, let's talk about how complicated these stages and levels of ballet are. So as we talked about in the last episode, for adults, zero is very different for each of us because each of us is coming to ballet with a very, very different breadth of experience in our lives. Some of us come with coordination. Some of us come with flexibility. Some come with musicality. Some come with none of the above. And it's a wholly new experience. And so for each of us, it's a highly individual process. So to even consider putting them into specific levels or specific chunks of information is a little bit tricky because for some people, level one is going to look a little bit different than level two. Uh, For some people, level one, if it's a specific set of 10 different skills, they may already come in knowing nine of them and only need one of them. Whereas some of us will come in not knowing any of those 10 things and needing to learn all of them. So really thinking about how one individual adult could structure or work through the things that they need to learn is a little bit different than just level one consists of these hundred lessons, because for some people, they may need more or less than those hundred. They may need different ones in order to achieve the same skills. So levels is really complicated to call it levels implies that you could move linearly, but ballet progression is so non-linear. For some of us, it takes a really long time to warm up to the idea of turning. For some of us, jumping is never something we're interested in. Um, For some of us, we don't want point work or we don't want a partner or we don't want different parts of it. So to call it levels is, is complicated when you get down to the granular individual level. The idea of calling it a spiral did interest me in that it's still rather linear, although you're just kind of winding through different twists and turns chaotic mess is also still not quite accurate because there is somewhat of a method to the madness, even though it feels a little bit chaotic in the beginning. It's kind of a web, except not every skill is related in this web. For example, counting music doesn't have much to do with strengthening your core. I mean, you can strengthen your core to music, but they are sort of unrelated skills. There are also many parallel tracks of skills but there's an interdependency between some of them. For example, strength, flexibility, and technique are all combined to create high extensions. You wanna train them in parallel with each other, but there is interdependency with them. It's not really a stair step either. Stairs also imply linear progression, and sometimes if you picture a step being too big, you couldn't really climb it. So in reality, where I've landed is that your ballet training is a collection of different skills, different facets, some related, some not, that must be developed independently, but then they come together to create the beautiful gem that is your ballet technique. Within the whole of ballet, there are micro facets, such as pirouettes could be their own quote-unquote gem with many facets, uh, where you're thinking about balance, control, momentum, body awareness, physics, timing, musicality, all of that, little pieces of each of those going into a pirouette. Ballet is incredibly unique, in that we need to do two things. Number one, we need to learn how to dance. But number two, we need to learn an entirely new movement pattern. We need to learn a new way to be. We need to learn how to exist with our legs turned out. We need to eat, breathe, feel the turnout the whole time with our arms in a specific place and our bodies in a specific posture. 
On top of this, we also need to learn to dance, how to move our bodies, how to understand physics, how to get momentum, how to get power, how to remember combinations, how to dance with the music, how to express, and all of that. Other styles only need to remember combinations and dance with the music. So you don't need to learn how to turn out your legs in jazz class. You do have some technique you need to learn in order to do pirouettes and turns, but it's a little bit different in that you don't have to relearn how to stand. You don't have to relearn how to exist with your legs turned out. So in those classes, you don't need the bar work. You go in, you do a quick warm up, and you get right to the dancing. But in ballet, we need to learn how to manage and control every part of our body in order for ballet to look and work correctly. So our classes are longer, more in-depth, and include bar work. So today, we're going to talk about all the different facets. Let's go through them all. So let's say we lump them into four big groups. We have their breadth. This is the dancing. We have the depth. This is the technique. We have the performing and storytelling. And then we have your personal and body strength. So within the breadth, the dancing, this is where we get all the different vocabulary. So knowing all the different words, if you like to learn how to spell, knowing how to spell all of them with all of the accents, this is knowing all the different words in ballet. So, you know, the the few hundred different vocabulary words, knowing all of them, knowing which foot to step on, knowing where they would come in a combination, kind of knowing the lay of the land. Arguably, You can know the vocabulary without having the technique. You can know how to do these things. You can know what a tour jeté is without necessarily being able to execute one flawlessly. So learning the vocabulary, I think, is a separate thing than learning how to do the vocabulary and executing it at a higher level. Each step, each vocabulary term has its own set of levels, we could say, within it, where you're going to, you know, start with a tondu how it looks at the beginner level to the pro level is different on each way. Each individual vocabulary term has a range and a spectrum of levels. Within breadth and the dancing, you also have memorizing combinations. Yes, dancers, this is a skill that gets better with time. Memorizing combinations is something you practice. It is something you learn. We will be talking about it. It has to do with so many different factors that you do get better at. You really do. You really do learn how to pick up choreography and how to internalize it more quickly. Within depth, the technique, we have your posture, we have your core control, we have your hip control, and we have developing the motor patterns for turnout. This is what bar work is. Basically, if you could picture all the ways that your legs can move turned out, that's what you have at the bar. You can bend them, you can straighten them, you can lift them, you can throw them, you can bend them one way, you can bend them another way. And this is what bar work is. This is developing the motor patterns for turnout. We have an entire episode dedicated to bar work, what it is, what we're doing at the bar, but that's going to be your depth. The depth is what will give us the different levels of breadth that I mentioned. So within each vocabulary word, as we learn a vocabulary word at the surface level, each level of each vocabulary word has a deep trench of technique that will continue to level up that specific word or that specific step. The third area, the performing and storytelling, I would put all of this with the personal expression. I would put this with musicality, with counting music, with understanding how to play with the music, with understanding how dance personifies the music. I would put artistry in here. So that's your facial expressions. That's your your apomol. That's your expressivity. That That's how well you are portraying what is inside into the outside. So when it comes to artistry, uh, we're, we're, we're always trying to allow our body to project what we feel inside into the, into the outer world. This is where you're going to get your pantomime, uh, all of the, the sort of vocabulary of ballet and the, the sign language of ballet. This is where I would also put choreo- choreographing, so the skill of choreographing, so as a dancer making up your own dance. Now, you'll notice each of these individual facets is its own individual thing. You don't need to know how to make choreography in order to learn a pirouette. They're two completely independent things. It's helpful to know how to make up your own choreography so that you can more easily practice your pirouettes at home if you wanted to practice in a different combination or something. You can make it up yourself, but they're really unrelated skills. In the fourth category, 
of facets is the personal and body strength. I would put in here your athleticism. Yes, you are an athlete. When you are a dancer, you are working on becoming more athletic. You are working on your athletic strength, your power, your stability, your stamina. I would put your flexibility in here. I would put your mindset in here. Your mind is a very, very powerful tool. When we are training, when we're training our technique, we need to train our minds to think more precise thoughts. We need to train our mind to think more clearly. We need to train our mind to think optimistically. We need our mind to not overwhelm us with anxiety. We need to teach our mind how to respond to scary situations. How do you respond to the sensations of point work? How do you respond to stage fright? How do you respond to criticism? How do you respond to bad days in your body? How you respond to injuries and setbacks? All of this is a very important part of your journey with ballet because it's all part of it. And it's all, if you want to get to several years into your ballet training, which all of this is a long game, the mindset is going to help you keep going through all of that and not give up when you hit different setbacks that we all inevitably do. Last thing I would put here in this fourth category is coordination your intuitive sense of how to move your body. Intuitive doesn't mean you have to have been born with it. Um, I truly believe you can develop intuition. For example, Warren Buffett wasn't born with an intuition of which stocks would do well. He developed it over years of reading, noticing, experimenting, and learning. So our intuition of our body can be developed. Our understanding of momentum, our understanding of physics, of power, of gravity, of how our limbs work together, all of that coordination is key. So as we have an overview here of the different areas and facets of ballet, let's talk about how they're actually applied in class. So when you're actually taking a 90-minute ballet class Again, I'm going kind of on this season on your standard 90-minute open drop-in program class. When you're taking a 90-minute class, what are you getting? What are you learning? What do you want to focus on outside of that and kind of give you an overview of what to expect from these different facets in your group classes? Most adult open programs focus only on the facet of breadth the combinations. Which foot goes where? You tendu three times and then you plie and then you go to the side and you plie and then you go to the back. The main focus is on the breadth, on the surface level, on the vocabulary, on the combination, on remembering the the combination, on picking up the choreography. All of these are within that first category of breadth, the dancing. Sometimes you also get musicality within these classes. Sometimes you'll also get a little bit of flexibility and athleticism. If you have some bar stretches or some releves within class, you might get some of those as well. But a lot of times the focus, what the teacher is saying, what they're cueing you is about the breadth or the dancing. So there, there's a lot missing there in terms of the technique, the performing, the storytelling, um, the, the mindset, the coordination, some of those things that take a little bit longer and a little bit more focused work to develop. So I want to get into a little bit about why I think this is, um, because a lot of what I want to do here is help you see from the perspective of the teacher, from the perspective of the studio owner, to understand why, so that when, when you advocate for change in your own studios, if you are looking for these different things, that you have a little bit more perspective and can go into these conversations more informed and you know kind of kind of navigate the system a little bit better, because I truly don't believe that anyone out there who's doing their best to make ends meet and provide classes for you is doing it with malintent in any way. So helping understand what's going on, I think is really important to continuing to advocate for change in your own local programs and also just seeking out additional solutions for you to reach your goals. So we talked a lot in the last episodes about the varying goals of adult dancers and in adult open programs, generally speaking, you're catering to all of the dancers. You are, you have a room full of mixed faces, uh, of mixed goals, of mixed levels, and you're really trying to make the most appealing and and general class to the people in your class because adult classes, um, generally speaking, make a good amount of money for a studio, um, especially if they're an open class and can get more attendance um, on, on different days. Can, can make a good amount for the studio and you want to keep people coming back. So a lot of times we'll actually focus on those more superficial aspects of ballet in the open program to try to cater to the majority of the people in the room. 
they tend to be a little bit more, a little bit more dancey, you know, a little bit more uh, focused on the fun aspects of ballet. Um, in, in my opinion, fun is the technique as well. Um, and, and perhaps if you're a technique geek listening to this episode, you might be in that boat as well. But picture your teacher. A lot of times the teachers are professional dancers or they, they work with kids, uh, pre-professional students all day. And they spend all day hammer getting hammered with technique or hammering other people with technique. And so perhaps picture, in some cases, they might envision how fun it would be to just let loose and dance and then projecting that desire onto their adult students, just thinking how fun it would be. I bet these adults are here for a good time. They came here after work. They're really stressed. I bet they want to just have some fun and do some dancing. They might even worry that they'll bore an adult if they take time talking about the minutiae. It- it can bore the kids. I am in a part of so many groups of teachers and within the within these groups uh, of people working with kids, they talk about how the parents complain ad nauseum about how much time they spend on technique, about how it bores the kids. Um, of course, all of this is, you know, kind of generalizations. I'm sure there are kids and parents out there who, who love this. But if you picture that that is the environment that these teachers are in and then they get a, a group full of eager adults, uh, perhaps they don't, they don't want to bore them. They have a bit more freedom in the class and they, you know, want to show them a good time and keep them engaged in ballet and perhaps well-meaning go about it in a way that isn't what you're looking for as a technique geek let's call ourselves as a studio owner i've had people quit because they're bored they'll reach out and they'll say you know your classes are really just too boring we go too slow we talk about technique i just want to dance across the floor and if you're a studio owner or a teacher and you receive feedback like that and you already hold the belief that adults just want to come and go across the floor then an email like this is going to really just hammer home the point that adults don't want to learn this sort of thing and like i said in the previous episodes there is nothing wrong with not wanting to learn this stuff there's nothing wrong with only wanting to focus on breadth or on that portion of it. As adults, as people who are doing this because we love it, because we are dancers, because we can't be here without dancing, because it's part of who we are, it can be part of who you are in whatever way you want it to be. So there's nothing wrong. I'm not begrudging anyone who doesn't want to learn technique. It's just another way to be. And it's possible that the studio owners and teachers are catering to that specific type of dancer because you will get feedback like this when you do go into the details and the minutia. You have to really believe that that is what, how you want to teach in order to be able to hear this feedback and keep doing what you're doing. Another thing, the teacher might be afraid of injuring their students. Encouraging adults to push themselves is a little different than encouraging a child to push themselves. Adult bodies are strong and fully grown. But we also have to be more careful with ligaments, with old injuries, with joints that have already lived a long life. We have to be careful in how we encourage adults to work on their turnout, being really careful with knee safety, being really careful with backs, being really careful with shoulders. And it's just a little different way about it. It requires a different type of training um, for the teachers. It's a different mindset, encouraging adults to push their limits, but in a really safe and sustainable way so that the students are able to keep coming back. This can be really scary, though. It's really scary to push people beyond their limits. Um, it It can be a very difficult experience for the teacher, especially if they're not used to encouraging or pushing adults beyond that point. The teacher might also be used to kids with a background in dance. When you're working with kids who have a background in dance, it is a whole different ballgame than working with an adult who hasn't experienced any of these things. So teaching adults and kids is so incredibly different. Teaching kids, they really rely on mimicking a lot, especially young kids. If you do something, they will mimic it. It's actually incredible. They mimic really, really well. But adults don't have that sort of mirroring thing that they do as adults. They really need a deep explanation of what's going on. They need everything kind of broken down and not just copying. It's, it's a different way that we, that we learn as adults. Additionally, we have much more deeper rooted movement patterns in our body. And so to explain something isn't enough. We have to take the time to be patient while the new motor pattern is instilled in the adult dancer's body. Not to mention that there is just so much stuff to learn in ballet. If you've been dancing since you were three or five or even a young child, you forget how much there is to learn. I mean, even for me, if it's been a while since I taught absolute beginners, when I go back into an absolute beginner class, it can be kind of jarring and I think, oh wow, yeah, I really have to slow it down. There's so much to remember that you have to say 
the dancers don't even know why you're saying five, six, seven, eight at the beginning of a combination. They don't know how far away from the bar to stand. I mean, there's just so much stuff that you need to tell people that they don't know. They don't know. How would they know it? How would you know these things if you weren't taught it? But as a teacher, especially when you live ballet every single day and you say the same things over and over again, it's actually really hard to remember all the things you have to tell a new ballet dancer because there are so many things you have to tell a new ballet dancer. You have to tell them about their toes, about their fingers, where to stand at the bar, how to put their stuff in the side of the room, um, what the music is doing, how to spell these words in French, um, what these things are where your belly button goes. I mean, there's just an incredible amount you have to tell a dancer and it's actually really easy to forget all the things that you have to tell a dancer. I know it sounds like, how can you forget these things? But there's just so much like, imagine if you were going to try to teach someone English, where would you even start? There's, you are at such an advanced level in English that to go to a beginner and say, I don't know, I use the word the a lot. Maybe we should start with the, but like that's not at all where you should start with teaching English. But because you're at such an advanced level, it's hard to remember what you should learn first or all the things that a beginner isn't going to know because it's just massive. So a lot of things go unsaid, not out of malice or anything, but just because it's sometimes really hard to remember all the different things you need to say, especially because, as I mentioned, adults don't tend to mimic the same way that kids do. Adults will look at you and see something different than what kids will see. Kids will just mimic. They will watch the behavior, pick it all up, soak it all up. But adults learn in a completely different way. They sort of need an explicit explanation of things. So there's a lot to explain. And if you haven't had to explain it on a long time, there's a lot of explaining to do. If the teacher is used to teaching kids who have a background in dance and who can mimic and who learn in that way, Again, it can be it can be surprising or cause a lot of anxiety if you are met with an adult who isn't picking it up the same way that you're used to teaching it. It can be a little bit like you're on the spot when you're trying to get someone to learn a waltz and they can't pick it up as the same way that a kid would. Here's an example I'll give you. There is something that a phenomenon that I like to call body dyslexia, where there's a whole subset of dancers, uh, of adult dancers. Uh, for me, I think the theory that I have going is the more visual the person is, the more visual of a learner, the stronger this body dyslexia is. But here's what it is. It's this phenomenon where you will tell a dancer to step on their left or their right foot. And a lot of times there's a, there's a moment of hesitation where the dancer doesn't know which foot is the left foot or the right foot. If you tell them to turn to the left and pick up their left foot, there is a hesitation. Often they'll pick up the wrong foot or turn the wrong direction. Um, there is a, a, a sort of mirroring where their their mind is a little bit mirrored to what you would expect. This, interestingly, applies to plie and releve. When you have a dancer with this sort of body dyslexia, when you tell them to bend their knee or to plie, they actually often nothing happens when you tell them that. And as a teacher, you really generally expect something to change when you tell someone something. That way you can tell if they got it or not. And when nothing happens, it can be a little bit alarming because how many ways are there to say bend your knees? And if someone's not bending their knees or isn't able to pick that up, as a teacher, it can give you a lot of anxiety um, to have that uh, inability to communicate what's what you need the dancer to do to to create the step and the footwork. So if you haven't come across this before, it can be a little bit it can be it can be a little bit challenging for the teacher. So there's so many factors going into it from the teacher's perspective, um, where if this is your first time coming about it, or if you're not used to it, or if you haven't seen it before, um, it it can be it can be alarming number one you can uh, it can trigger feelings of inadequacy in that teacher it can trigger all kinds of different things in that teacher that could be going on that will cause them to sort of pull back from that uh, that confidence in being able to teach this student or adults in general last point here uh, a teacher who is often a dancer in the company is giving class often how they're used to taking class which is very different from what an adult beginner would need so if you are a company dancer your company class is going to be a bit different a lot different than someone who is an adult beginner an adult beginner needs a full explanation about what's going on so an, a new dancer who has never done it, done it before comes into class and 
doesn't know how to use their core, right? That's not something that we learn unless we've been taught it. That's not something that we learn unless you've been specifically trained in your former life. Maybe you did gymnastics, maybe you did other athletic endeavors. Unless you've been trained how to use your core, you probably won't know how to use it on day one because it's rather difficult, like all things in ballet, (laughs) if you haven't figured that out already. So when you're working with a new adult dancer, You need to explain to them what it means to engage their core. They won't come in knowing how to engage their core. But when you're a professional dancer, all the teacher needs to say is, don't forget your core. And because you know how to engage your core, and so do your classmates, everyone just takes the reminder and executes on it. But for a new dancer, you don't need a reminder. You need an explanation. So giving class and giving reminders to a room of people who don't know what's going on is a lot different than giving reminders to a room full of professional or advanced dancers. So to a group of advanced dancers, you can say, don't forget your turnout or focus on your standing leg. But to a new dancer, they don't know what those things mean. They don't know what it means to focus on their standing leg. They need a whole maybe 15 or 20 minute lecture on what it means to focus on their standing leg and then continuing to help them develop that fine grain control. So picture someone if we're trying as dancers, we're trying to build like a control center dashboard on our body. If someone already has that built, all they need to do is just turn the little knobs and dials on their control center. But if someone doesn't have a control center and you tell them to turn a knob, they don't even have a control center yet. You need to build that from the ground up. So there's so many reasons why I think that generally speaking, adult classes play it safe and teach adults the breadth, the choreography, the dancey things. Again, none of these I think are for any ill intention other than what I've mentioned here. Maybe there's some other things to it, but I think these are really the the crux of it and the, the experiences that you can have from a teacher's perspective as to why they may not be giving you the technique that you, uh, that you really crave and that you want to learn. So as we're navigating these open programs that are really only focusing on the facet of of breadth, when the beginner classes, what often happens is even though we haven't mastered the technique, we find ourselves bored after a little while because we already kind of know these combinations. We feel like we're not getting any better because we're not working on technique. We think the point is that we've remembered the combinations. And so once we think we've achieved that point, we're ready to move up. Really, the point isn't that. The point is to do that with technique while learning the technique. But if the beginner class isn't really teaching you what you should be focusing on, you'll get a little bored without having those things to fit to to think about. So then we have that gap that I was talking about in the last episode, where you're going to feel like you want to move up to intermediate but in intermediate, the combinations are going to be so complex. Uh, there's going to be steps you've never seen before. And then at that point, the, ste- the combinations are far too complex for you to even think of technique. So in the intermediate classes, sometimes the teacher does begin to focus on technique. But by then, you're so overwhelmed with all the different combinations and the new steps and the new body directions and all that stuff that there's often no room for additional thought of technique. We need simple combinations to focus on technique. Beginner classes do give you simple combinations, but they don't necessarily focus on technique. So then you move to intermediate and now the combinations are too complex and there's the technical direction, but it's too much to think about to even apply the technique. But the thing is the beginner class isn't suitable place to practice because if you're still learning those mental cues and you don't know what you should be working on for technique yet, then you go to the beginner class and you'll just be bored again with simple combinations and not able to remember what you should be working on for the technique. So ideally what happens is we work on our depth, we work on our breadth, and eventually we merge them together and your depth applies to your breadth. That's when we get the advanced skills, the clean technique, and our detailed center work. But the depth is developed slowly with great care and great focus. We want to try to find a place to learn to sweat standing still, learn how to be out of breath and break a sweat by the end of doing 16 tendus in first position with two hands on the bar. If pirouettes are your goal, 10 years of waltzing across the floor maniacally and then squeezing in one flustered pirouette at the end isn't going to get you there. You're going to leave every class feeling dejected thinking you'll never get pirouettes. But that's not how you work on pirouettes. If you focus on balancing drills, on posture, on turnout, on releve strength, and you work slowly and methodically, you can learn pirouettes. I've taught people clean double pirouettes in just one year since the start of their ballet journey, starting to work on that detailed technique in the beginning. So because adult beginners learn breadth first, 
for the record, kids usually learn depth first. They go way deep. They learn very few new steps. They go 100% depth and not breadth first. The reason I think that can fly with kids is because they're sort of forced to continue going at that level. And I think there's there's sort of an expectation that that's what's going on. It's very possible that one day we're going to get there with adult beginners where we have that extraordinarily slow technical process to begin with. But I think for the most part, we learn in a different way and we can learn many different things at once and we're interested in many different things at once. So I think as adults, we don't necessarily need to go that same route. But there's a point that is going to feel like regression if you've only been learning breadth without depth. I've been there. Many adults in open programs are there. Advanced open classes cover breadth and not depth. Then you get to that point, you can follow along in an intermediate class, you can do all the waltzes across the floors, but you can't land a pirouette. Basically, you've been learning the breadth without the depth. The skills aren't going to be developed, but the dancing will be developed. And then there's a frustration that feels like a plateau where the skills aren't there, but everything else is. Basically, what happens is once you've climbed the ladder of breadth, you look over and realize there's a whole other ladder called depth that you haven't even started climbing yet. Depth is ultimately how you get those higher level skills, but you have to hop over go down to the beginning and climb that technique ladder from the beginning. You have to swallow that pill that is so hard to swallow and start from what's going to feel like the beginning. It's not the beginning. It's just two separate things you have to learn, but the combinations, the breadth will go way back to zero while you learn the technique. So the last point here before we wrap up is what exactly is going on in one of these 90 minute open classes? So basically what's happening is it's putting it all together. What you're getting is a little bit of everything. You're scratching the surface of everything and you're getting a little bit of tondus, a little bit of ronde de jambes, a little bit of grand batma, a little bit of across the floor, a little petit allegro. You're putting it all together. That's great. So useful. So necessary. As I mentioned in the last episode, I think that's a staple of ballet. I think it's a lot of fun. It's great because it allows so many of us with different interests, different availabilities, different levels to come together and have a lot of fun together. I think that's so fun. But we also need to have the opportunity to take it all apart before we can put it back together again or in conjunction with putting it back together. So take it all apart into the individual facets, work on pirouettes by themselves, work on standing still, work on your feet, work on your athleticism, work on your flexibility as individual parts and components and facets so that you can have fun putting it together in the 90 minute class. In a 90-minute class, it's very difficult to cover all of these topics. And besides, if you are spend 90 minutes on turns, but it was advertised as a general class, half the people are going to be disappointed because that's not what they came for. So setting that expectation is key. If you're going to a class that's putting it all together, that's what's going on. But finding opportunities to take it all apart to put it back together again is the key to continuing to improve at the goals that you have set out for yourself. I'll say the fastest way to get there is private lessons. The fastest absolute way to get to where you're going and help put all these pieces together, help you take it apart, is private lessons. No doubt. It is all focused on you. It is completely tailored to your goals, completely tailored to what you're looking for, what you want, and where you've been in the past. No doubt the fastest way to do it. I've done lots of private lessons in my life as a ballet dancer. I've taught them. They're they're a lot of fun on so many levels. But I don't think you should have to go to private lessons for it. I think if you have the means, if you have a teacher who's interested, whether in person or online, do it. By all means, go for it. Private lessons are amazing. But I want there to be a way for adults to learn the majority of things without having to turn to private lessons. How can you learn 80% of each of the facets without private lessons? Where are the opportunities to have turning workshops, to have classes on flexibility, on extensions, on athleticism, on these individual facets so that we can learn, get exposed to all of them, learn about what they are, and then decide where we want to focus and how we want to move forward. Having this in a group setting, I think, really opens it up to more and more people. Having it, having it reserved for private lessons is really, really tough because all this stuff takes a long time to learn. It takes a long time to learn pirouettes. It takes a long time to develop technique. It takes a long time to develop all these different things. And if you have to go to a private lesson to learn about each and every one of these, it's going to really, really add up fast. 
And so having these resources in a group setting, in a lower cost setting is the most ideal scenario. And I think something that the uh, adult ballet world can really, really benefit from to be able to break these down and learn them at a rudimentary level without having to go to private lessons. So in the next episode, we're going to dive into your technical depth. We're going to really talk about what it is, what to seek out, what to look for to try to find opportunities to learn this, uh, th- the terminology, the verbiage, the understanding of what we're looking for with technical depth so that you can think about how you'll seek it out, how you can find it, if it's something you're interested in or not, and really start to see the technical depth, start to see the skills through a different lens of really what we're trying to do at the bar, why we're at the bar for so long, why it's so difficult to get it to translate into the center, all of that good stuff so that you can start to understand it at a deeper level and really know what to look for if it's something that you're interested in getting in working on in studying in a deeper level. The episodes after that, we're going to keep picking apart each of these individual facets and really getting into what it is, what to look for, how to seek it out, and how to decide if it's something that you are interested in. I've been loving hearing what you guys think about these episodes so far. If you have questions, if you have concerns, if you have comments, please reach out to me. It's been so fun to have a chance to connect with you all about your ballet training, about what parts of what I'm saying are resonating, what parts are bringing up more questions. I'd love to hear from you. You can leave a comment. If you're watching this on YouTube, you can send me an email, hello at brocheballet.com. That's hello, like you're saying hi to me at brocheballet.com. On Instagram at brocheballet, reach out, drop me a line. I would really love to hear from you and how all of this is resonating with your own ballet journeys, your hopes, your dreams, and your goals. So until next time, happy dancing. Thanks for listening today, dancers. Before we head out, please make sure you leave us a review or just a five-star rating on the podcast app where you have accessed this podcast. It really does help us out and help us reach more ballet dancers like you. For more adult ballet, you can follow our studio on Instagram and Facebook at Broche Ballet. You can follow me on Instagram at Julie the Ballerina, or check out our blog and YouTube channels for more content. You can even dance with us in our online studio with daily live Zoom classes and our on-demand library. I'm Julie Gill, and this was Broche Banter. Banter.